Um, so everyone should have the minutes of the last meeting in front of them. And I think they were sent out <coughs> uh, a while ago. Any, um, any comments or changes? Yes. It's a tiny little change. Sure. Um, there's voices for Vermont's children. who just need to be cost with the test. Indeed. Yes. Okay. Great. That's in the other members present. Is that anywhere else or just there? So move. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Just that one change. And uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay. Motion carries. The minutes are approved. And we're going to start off this morning talking about housing and homelessness. And um, Airford Monkey is going to kick us off. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time on the Council's agenda for housing and, and homelessness. Um, and just uh, for uh, council members, it's going to be a slight change in the, in the schedule um, because um, one of our witnesses um, uh, was unable uh, to make it. I asked uh, Commissioner Sean Brown to come talk about the, um, after the situation with Vermont 211 and the after hours, uh, hours changes. Um, and in his place, uh, it's going to be Karen Bastien. Um, she has some time constraints. So uh, after some brief, uh, just some brief comments from me, uh, I was going to ask Karen to to speak and then we'll come back to 211 uh, a little bit later because uh, Mary Ellen Mendel from uh, Vermont 211 is here to, to speak about the impact and, and uh, what it means for uh, her agency. Um, and then also, if you haven't had a chance to look at the agenda, um, Emily Higgins is here from the uh, Vermont Office of Economic Opportunity. She's going to talk about a couple of uh, programs that um, are out of their office uh, that help alleviate homelessness and um, provide homelessness prevention resources, that being the uh, Housing Opportunity Grant Program and Family Supported Housing. We also have Ellen Hender, who's with the Upper Valley Haven, and she's going to delve um, somewhat deeply into a particular case of someone that she's working with as a, as a case manager at the Upper Valley Haven to uh, help folks kind of understand what um, some of the successes and challenges are and the benefits of, uh, of the Family Supported Housing Program. Um, so with, with all that said, just um, I wanted to just mention a couple things. Um, first of all, I didn't want to focus a lot on need. I'm sort of assuming that uh, everyone understands at this point and it's fairly well established that um, we have an ongoing housing, affordable housing shortage and affordable housing really chronic crisis uh, in, the, in the state of Vermont. And it's really not just in the state of Vermont. It's region-wide and it's, uh, and it's natural, national. I did, though, want to give you a couple of quick data points that have just come out over and since the legislature uh, adjourned. So um, for uh, lawmakers, I, I especially, I wanted to highlight uh, one of the things, one of the barometers that we use for housing affordability, for rental housing in the state of uh, Vermont and, and nationally is through a report by our National Welcome Housing Coalition, um, which uh, annually puts together the out of reach report and publishes the housing wage, um, which basically says how much you have to earn to afford a modest two bedroom apartment in every jurisdiction uh, in the country. And the housing wage in 2019, the average housing wage in the state of Vermont is now $22.78 an hour. So, Twenty-two seventy-eight is what you've got to earn if you're uh, gonna not pay more than thirty percent of your income for your shelter costs. If you pay more than thirty percent, you don't have enough left over for other basic life necessities, and at some point, uh, a, an unexpected uh, emergency, um, a major car payment, uh, can land you in a spiral of, uh, of homelessness. That equates to about forty-six thousand five hundred a year. Uh, in terms of annual salary. And, um, it's worse than the Burlington, greater Burlington area. Uh, there you need just under 30 bucks an hour. Um, for So if you only have one wager earner in the, in the household, you're, you're basically um, in, in, in rough shape on the rental market. All this is documented. I have a number of handouts that are uh, online. Um, so you can run down, uh, download e-copy if you want. Um, and we also have hard copy. This is the, the sheet that uh, we put out. Um, uh, around that with a, a whole bunch of data points around affordability in, in Vermont. They're all over here on the table. I can pass them out later for folks who might not hard copy. Um, 
And then uh, another um, data sheet that we get from our national uh, association is a Vermont housing profile, which gives you kind of a very quick look at um, you know, just how bad our affordability crisis is. Um, we have just over 18,000 uh, renter households that are extremely low income in Vermont. That's uh, extremely low income is defined as um, making 24600 a year. Uh, we have a shortage of rental homes that are both affordable and available uh, to extremely low income renters of almost 12,000 uh, rental units in the state. And the annual uh, house, um, approximately 68% of those extremely low income house renter households uh, have a severe cost burden, meaning that they pay more than 50% of their shelter cost, uh, of their uh, income for their shelter costs. Um, if they're simply cost burdened, they pay more than 30%, and 87% of extremely low income renters, again, uh, with household incomes of less than 24 six a year, 87% um, of ELI uh, extremely low income renters are cost burdened, meaning that they um, uh, pay more than 30%. Um, also, um, a handout uh, <coughs> on the table here and in the uh, uh, committee um, in the, on the committee webpage is just a very truncated version of the annual point in time count of homelessness. This is an annual barometer of homelessness. It's imperfect, like many of the other measures. It doesn't, you know, it's a one one day, one night snapshot. Um, and just a quick highlight, we've actually made some progress there. So there's a 15% decrease um, in overall homelessness. Uh, 1,089 uh, individuals were homeless, uh, found to be homeless back in um, uh, January of 2019. Uh, of those, however, 251 or 23% were children under 18. Um, and uh, there was a, that was about uh, unchanged, just about unchanged. Uh, level to uh, 2018. Uh, however, the number of unsheltered individuals <laughs> went up by 39% to 114 individuals. Uh, of that, those 1,089 homeless, uh, 133 were fleeing domestic violence, which was a 12%, uh, actually a 12% um, increase. Um, and homelessness uh, in, even in, uh, in Vermont, you know we're the second whitest state in the, in the country. Homelessness uh, disproportionately affects uh, African Americans and, and uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, Hispanic residents. Um, so I also have a couple of other uh, handouts that I'm not going to um, really go into at all, but um, there are some, there's a lot of research that's being done, especially on the impact of uh, homelessness and housing insecurity on, uh, on children, on children's health and on children's outcomes. And I'll just um, mention this one from the Children's Health Watch, uh, which has done incredible pioneering research on the connection between health, housing, and, uh, and homelessness. Um, and uh, uh, talks about all the different ways in which uh, both housing conditions, homelessness, and housing instability uh, affect children's uh, health in, in a number of different ways. And their recommendations are very similar to ours. Um, they're basically, you need three things. Uh, you need uh, additional affordable housing, and for that we need uh, more capital dollars uh, through, for instance, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. You need more rental assistance so that folks at the low end of the economic spectrum who can't afford market rents have uh, federal or state assistance to help make up the difference between what they can afford uh, and what's available on the market so they're not cost burdened. And then finally, for folks with multiple challenges, uh, they will need supportive services uh, because uh, affordable housing and a, a, a rental assistance voucher alone uh, are not going to help them succeed in housing. They may have multiple uh, multiple barriers to success in housing and will need, in many instances, ongoing supportive services in order for them to succeed. And that's the thing that we're actually going to focus a fair amount on uh, on today through uh, through um, the testimony. So um, we're focusing on family homelessness uh, and its impact on children and, and the programs that help uh, alleviate that. So with that, um, oh, I, I should just also mention I had hope that we could get an update from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board on their 2017 uh, housing revenue bond, which is just about um, spent out or out fully allocated, and it's helped us make a lot of headway, um, but um, it's just about done. And so we're going to, VHCB is going to need another major infusion of funds so as not to continue to fall further, uh, further, further behind. The housing revenue bond really helped us 
catch up uh, in the affordable housing sector. Uh, obviously not all the way, um, but it has made a significant difference over the last three years, um, but with it uh, just about coming to an end. Um, if we don't either fully fund VHCB or get a new housing bond uh, for new infusion, uh, we're going to continue to fall behind again. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that there is an active uh, work group um, that the Agency of Human Services has put together um, in response to uh, language in the budget last year, which uh, I know represent uh, Lanthier is very aware of, um, uh, around um, the underutilization of federal Section 8 vouchers uh, as a result of insufficient um, supportive services to, uh, to pair with those. And that report is um, due uh, shortly um, next month. And so I'm hoping that um, maybe there might be some time uh, at a future meeting on the council's agenda to A, hear from DHCB, and B, uh, uh, hopefully hear from Allison Hart in the secretary's office, um, who has been uh, offering, um, the primary author of that, uh, of that report. Um, I'm going to um, stop there. And I would just uh, interject, if I may, uh, you know, that we did try to, in the Senate, we were proposing a bond, another housing bond, and uh, I, but I have spoken to Treasurer Peterson, I, I know that she um, was reluctant to have this uh, state take on more debt, but she's looking into, um, she's looking into that, she sure, you know, sure just that, that she will come up with some kind of proposal for other, other ways to fund housing. Thank, thank you, Senator. We've been talking to Treasurer Pierce and uh, also uh, Senator Sorokin's committee is uh, on the road. They're going to be in St. Albans uh, next, uh, next Tuesday um, uh, in, in the third of their series of regional hearings on, on housing. So, uh, thank you. Can I just ask a quick question? Uh, sure. Um, so I don't know if you have an answer to this, but are you um, tracking in any way the impact of the increasing number of short-term rentals uh, being, um, you know, transitioned away from long-term apartment rentals. Do you really quantify that? I mean, we hear a lot of anecdotes, but we yeah. don't have any sort of quantification of that. Um, in a word, no. Um, and yeah, there's no quantification. I think the only way to kind of quantify that is through the tax department because short-term rentals are now, as a result of the General Assembly Police Action two years ago, uh, are all required um, to pay uh, rooms and meals tax. And um, so that is really the only potential quantification. I think that tourism, marketing and tourism, if I'm remembering right, um, was going to be doing a study on uh, Air, uh, Airbnb and the other platforms. Um, I'm not sure if that study is out, but I will add that there is a rental housing advisory board that the General Assembly uh, impaneled and provided further instructions to this year. I sit on that board, and one of the things that we're going to be coming back to you with is uh, a request to uh, actually create a, uh, a rental housing database, of, uh, a rental housing database that includes um, conversions from rental housing to uh, short-term rentals so that we can track that because right now the only way to track that is through the tax department and, um, and, and registration for rooms and meals tax. And that doesn't even really tell you whether or not they previously, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, okay. I, the first witness was Karen, uh, excuse me, <laughs> not this Karen. <laughs> Karen Vestine. <laughs> Karen Vestine. Um, so. Right, and so, Karen. Uh, so, just Peggy, so you know that Karen is not on the oh, yeah. original list. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. Okay, great. I just want to make sure you're all yeah. Yeah. Yes, please join us. And will I mess up all of your technology if I close this? Um, I don't know. The laptop? Peggy, I don't want to do anything about it. No, we'll close it almost all the way. So, good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Bastine. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families, and I just wanted to say thank you to Erhard for giving us a minute this morning just to brief you on um, what we're doing with respect to um, mitigating the impact of um, the After Hours 211 referral service. Um, not being in existence. So um, Erhard actually very kindly um, printed one of our um, one of our handouts, and I'm actually just going to give these back to you, Erhard, if that's all right. Um, <clears throat> so I will be highlighting some of the points in that. So um, thought it might help you to have that in front of you. Thank you. So um, just to take a step back, I think that um, 
I would be remiss if I didn't start this conversation by saying how much um, the Agency of Human Services, and uh, speaking on behalf of DCF in particular, how much we've appreciated our incredibly collaborative working partnership with Vermont 211, and I'm really glad that you all have a chance to hear from Mar Muriel and Nundal today. We consider her a very um, important partner, um, and we, of course, appreciate all the services that they provide. <coughs> Um, and a lot of those end up connecting folks to our services. So, um, I guess you all might be aware, uh, connecting people to um, DCS General Assistance Emergency Housing Program after hours was a small but <coughs> integral part of the 211 contract um, that was managed by the overall Agency of Human Services. So, um, the services provided by 211 from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, have been subcontracted out of state actually for a number of years. Um, and the provider informed us that um, due to um, increasing costs and increasing needs by, um, by uh, the emergency housing piece that it would be significantly more expensive to um, fund that contract. And so, um, despite numerous efforts and um, conversations to find a solution, um, the rates sought by uh, potential subcontractors for that services made this cost prohibitive for us. And so, um, the good news is that, um, if there is good news in this, is that for those seeking emergency housing, um, um, through uh, Vermont 211 that there was a number of factors that helped to offset um, this potential impact on Vermonters needing crisis housing. So I thought I'd just lay this out for you and these are also included in your the memo in front of you. So as you all are aware, um, Vermont 211 will actually still provide those services until 8 p.m. So their hours will be 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and I'll let Mary Ellen Mendel speak to those details. Um, and that most people <clears throat> access emergency housing either during business hours and then the second largest cohort of people accessing emergency, hour, uh, emergency housing are before 8 p.m. Um, so DCF will, um, in addition to those pieces, uh, DCF will continue its practice, for those of you who weren't aware, we will continue our practice of approving housing over weekends and holidays. Um, this is a, something that we had started doing anyway for folks who are um, seeking emergency housing through um, one, of the, uh, one of the two other buckets um, known as vulnerable um, and catastrophic categories. So depending on um, what their need is, we can approve housing for a number of days so that they're not um, missing a gap um, in a, that assistance. But we also do that for those folks who are seeking emergency housing during our um, adverse weather conditions um, <coughs> as well. So we will continue to do that practice, which we hope will offset this quite a bit. Um, as you might imagine, one of our biggest concerns then um, in terms of a gap here is um, uh, uh, with respect to folks who are fleeing domestic violence um, or have experienced sexual assault who um, need <coughs> crisis housing. And so um, for that piece, um, and as Earhart highlighted in terms of his overall numbers there, that we have seen a 12% increase in um, those seeking crisis housing who've experienced domestic violence. So we've actually been working very closely with um, the Vermont Network programs. Um, we really appreciate their wisdom and their experience of actually also um, keeping up and running for many years now, um, many decades actually, um, a 24-hour hotline um, crisis um, service. So we have been working with them to um, come up with a plan that would allow for folks to um, seek emergency housing through our partnership. And we're still working out those details, but I at least wanted to signal to you that we're very appreciative of the work that we've been able to um, get through with them so far that I think will provide that necessary support. And I think the other piece that's worth highlighting for this committee, because I know this is something that would be of interest to you, is that really since 2015, the DCF housing team, which is comprised of the Commissioner's Office, um, the Economic Services Division, as well as the Office of Economic Opportunity. So it's really that synergy between um, providing the safety nets through the Economic Services Division and then um, the OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity, as you'll hear from Emily later today on some of the programs that they're managing, that their role is to support and monitor um, uh, the homelessness service providers um, 
for whom we provide um, a lot of grants to. So we've been, um, since 2015, these entities have been working to reinvest general assistance funding in community-based strategies. I think that um, all of us would agree that um, just sending somebody to a motel without services is not the best approach for getting folks out of homelessness. And so um, currently in all of the AHS districts, there's at least one program that is serving people with reinvested GA funding. Um, and uh, with respect to the network program, um, several of their programs have actually started to take on managing the motel pool in their area. Um, and we're expecting that um, more programs will be um, starting to do that as well. So this is really helping to absorb um, <coughs> this uh, potential problem. And frankly, it's getting uh, uh, victims out of um, homelessness faster and getting them better services. So we will continue to do that, which um, uh, really, um, I think, uh, helps to mitigate the impact of this quite a bit. So um, that's what I have for you in terms of um, an update on that. And uh, we do appreciate, um, you know, Eric Hard giving us this time, but also the concern of this committee on this topic. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you for being here, Karen. Um, you said uh, it made it cost prohibitive. Can you quantify that for us? Um, so what I can give you is, and I, Mary Ellen Mendel will probably need to um, give you more details, but. Um, so the general assistance program um, has contributed, um, uh, 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 was budgeted to contribute $117,000 to um, uh, 211. Of that, 40000 was for the after hours work. As I understand it, the out-of-state provider who came in with the lowest cost estimate would have been seven times that amount. So it was a significant increase, and I will, I don't want to um, uh, steal Mary Ellen's thunder. I think that she's in the best position to explain why those costs have changed. So, and then I just wanted to say that I've, I've been to two meetings in the last week. We were both, one at Washington County Mental Health and one at Circle, the uh, domestic violence, one of the domestic violence programs, and both of them identified this as a significant issue. Um, and I'm not sure that they're feeling comforted by the things that you've laid out uh, and, you know, that you're trying to respond to. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, one, I, I work in a homeless shelter in Addison County, and I just wanted to mention that we do receive a number of calls after 8 p.m., um, and our course of action has always been to direct them to 211, so I just want to mention that we do receive a number, and I've worked in two shelters, one in Chittenden County, one in, in Addison. Um, but my question is, are you guys looking at next year or other years in terms of, is this something we can find an, another avenue for that might be less cost prohibitive, or is there, is that on the table to look at moving forward? Is this kind of a short term? Um, we are hoping that this is going to be a short term issue, and I would say that those conversations are very much ongoing. And I appreciate your points about the after hours calls. Okay. Um, yesterday at the Caledonia Southern Essex COC meeting, we were wondering, speaking of the collective, did the department kind of consider maybe staggering the times because 8 a.m. at 8 a.m. service providers are open and we are available to house people and then be in the community level of servicing folks. So, was there was there any conversation about shifting these hours, maybe instead of 8 to 8, like noon to midnight? Um, I appreciate that suggestion, and I would actually say that would be something that we could have as part of our ongoing discussion. That's a, it's a great idea. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, thank you again for giving me the time. <coughs> yes. I, I think if we could just switch back to our regular scheduled testimony and then have Mary Ellen come a bit later to uh, talk about the impact on 211 and her perspective. I really appreciate that. I'll, I'll also say that um, we've talked to a number, we've gotten a lot of alarms, a lot of alarm bells have gone off uh, in our network uh, around this, which is one of the reasons that uh, I uh, asked Mary Ellen to come in and talk today because I, I think this is just kind of an emerging crisis uh, in, uh, in the homeless service provider community. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're gonna, we're considering is uh, possibly asking if uh, the legislature could address this during budget adjustment. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Uh, so then we'll go on with Emily Hegan. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to use the, uh, the computer if that's possible to pull up presentations. Sure. I have hard copy of uh, Emily's uh, PowerPoint presentation for anyone who wants hard copies. Is it going to be up on the monitor? It's, it's going to be up on the monitor as soon as uh, Peggy's got it um, lined up. And it's certainly on the on the council's website, but some people like hard copies, so. I'll take Which one it looks like? Yeah, we've got two pieces here. Which one? Which one? It'll it'll just get brighter from you, right? Yeah. That's why I never. Close it and we'll go back to the. Yeah, this was. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. which is one of our affordable housing partners, and I uh, manage the homeownership center there. So um, I've been working in affordable housing and homelessness for quite a few years. Um, so I'm going to start by giving just a quick overview. I'm going to be very respectful of your time. I could spend hours going over these reports, but I'll spend about 10 minutes on each. And I'm going to start with the Family Supportive Housing Program. And I'll stop after each report uh, and answer questions. So um, the Family Support Housing, operated through our office, is uh, specifically tailored for families with complex needs who have experienced homelessness. Um, and this is not a statewide program currently. There are seven community providers. Um, one of whom is on the council, um, NECA, hosts a family supportive housing program, um, and they're listed there for your reference. We would love to expand this program to become statewide if possible, because uh, we've seen it have great success with um, families who are in very difficult circumstances. Uh, to be clear, um, the housing uh, through the Family Supportive Housing Program is not funded directly with Family Supportive Housing. It's actually permanent housing operated with partners, and there's an MOU between the Family Supportive Housing Provider and the, and the Affordable Housing Provider. So um, it's <coughs> a very, it's all about partnership in terms of offering that housing, and also um, those providers work hard to match families with family unification program vouchers through the Vermont State Housing Authority. And the focus of the program is intensive home-based case management. So caseloads are very small, 12 to 15 families per case manager. And there's a lot of effort to um, in work on financial empowerment and strengthening families and using a two-generation approach. In terms of prioritization and eligibility, households do need to meet the AHS and HUD definition of homelessness. And do please stop me if I'm using acronyms that you're not familiar with. I swim in acronyms. <laughs> um, and there is a prioritization process um, to focus on, on the families with the most complex needs, those with multiple episodes of homelessness, um, families who have an open case, an active case with Family Services Division in, in the Department for Children and Families, 
or families with at least one child under the age of six. And these are some of the things that we've been working on with the program. Again, I'm going to keep moving really quickly. Um, we do track and report on a number of outcomes uh, around all these different categories, housing stability, family engagement, child safety, job training and education and employment, health and wellness, and housing affordability. Uh, I'm just going to... There is a link also on your website to the full report, which is on the, the Office of Economic Opportunities website and available for download. It's PDF. And that goes into even more detail about all of these measures. Um, but just a snapshot here is um, even with this small program, we served 238 children under the age of six. So that's a significant proportion of the households had had multiple children under the age of six, because um, there were 210 families served and 484 individuals. Um, we track things like how long the families were homeless prior to entering in the program. As you can see, it fluctuates a bit. Uh, we track housing stability. Um, the good news is that over 70% of the households consistently, and sometimes as much as 90, have had very good housing stability while in the program. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes. So just back on the, the length of homelessness, the jump from 17 to 18 was significant. What happened? Yeah, you know? uh, we were a little bit surprised by that as well. Um, I don't know that we can point to a specific factor there. We did... Um, we have always prioritized families with the greatest need, um, and there was uh, sort of a shortage of housing vouchers. Do you, I don't know if other people have any insight to this, but... Um, is this the average? Sorry. Do you know? Uh, yes, it is. I wonder if there was a particularly outlined case that could Mm -hmm. I know that in Chittenden County, that was 17-18, um, there were some big changes at COTS in terms of how they were, um, they went from case managers to family navigators, um, which was a huge change for families, and I think the support that you got um, in the family, I'm a consumer from the Family Supportive Housing uh, Program, just to be a friend, and um, there was a pretty significant change in the services that were being provided. Um, and so I, I think there were a number of families that maybe were not getting their needs totally being met through COTS that were not at, in the program at the time that were then learning of the program. Some, some of it may have to do with, how, especially in Chittenden County and the Upper Valley, it may have to do with housing availability as well. So um, folks you know, may be stacked up in shelter uh, and there's no place to go. Shelters are full. There's no housing available. Uh, even if you have a voucher, you may not be able to <coughs> use that voucher in a very low uh, vacancy rental market like the greater Burlington area and like the upper, uh, upper Connecticut River Valley. And so that, that, that often determines, and there's been a lot of construction in Chittenden County just over the last two years. And so that, you know, that, those, those are factors. Um, and I can't specifically speak to those spikes, but um, those are clearly factors in the length of uh, people's, the average length of people's stay. Okay. Great Thank, you. Thank you. Um, so, Additionally, we delved into this issue of housing um, stability a little deeper this year, and in addition to the 76% of households in the program who were stably housed, there were 15% on top of that who actually had a voucher and were actively searching for housing. So over 90% of the households <coughs> were in a place to be in stable housing, just hadn't quite found <coughs> the unit that yet the apartment to, to be in. Um, and then successful program exits. Keep in mind, these are families with very, very complex needs, often substance use issues, mental illness, um, you know, DCF involvement. There's a lot going on there. And um, uh, over, let's see, over 70% in each year we've tracked it, we're able, of households in the program were able to exit in a positive manner, meaning they were still in stable housing and, um, their lives were 
getting to a better place. Um, and I'm going to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions here. So I just want to whip through the rest of this. Um, but I want to be clear that we're tracking community connections. So families who have access and um, relationships with organizations, um, self-help groups, advocacy groups, coalitions involved in their community development efforts and families within a community engagement plan because we know that um, connection is very important. And job training, again, we have... Um, yeah, we well, have... You know. Question, yes, yes. Behind you, behind you, sorry on that. Um, in terms of the community connections, um, a slightly different question, and I realize capacity may be an issue, but um, are there opportunities for um, folks in your program to connect um, with students at 264 groups? Um, so, um, at 264, um, mandates that students actually have a cohesive um, case management approach. And so I know in education, we are increasingly tracking homelessness and making sure that students get um, the resources they need. But, but if that's not happening, I'd want to chat with folks after because that's a real critical place, I think, to actually have some of those conversations. Sure. And are you doing anything mental act? And, and yeah, the it's part of that, yeah. but then broader as well. Um, but I would say yes, the, the family support of the case managers are involved in a ton of different training to make sure they're aware of all the resources and connections available. Um, we have talked about education and connection with the schools and the case management. Um, and I can't testify to exactly how perfectly that's happening in every community. But. Yeah. Yeah, because I just worry that um, not. That it's then. not happening. It's, not it's a just a critical part of students' mm -hmm. lives that is then not known potentially by the education system. And I have the agency of education, so that's why. Oh, excellent. Great, great. <laughs> that's what I bring. I mean, I think that's a good systems conversation to have yeah. around, like, who, who is the lead agency in yes. terms of holding that meeting and facilitating the meeting? Because I think it sometimes it's, is it the business agency, is it the school, should it be the family support housing worker? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think um, it's a, a good thing to bring back and think about with the role of these. Um, we did see some really impressive gains in financial empowerment for these households. So 27% of families had savings at enrollment, uh, and when uh, this is the number of households at the end of the year um, who were still in the program, 50% of them had savings. So we did see an increase there, and we do have a, a leverage program to help people increase their savings. Uh, and their financial capability score increased substantially over the three years, which is um, sort of a, a survey that households take talking about how they feel about their own finances. So it's really um, a measure of them feeling more financially capable and secure. Uh, and then child safety, um, like we can say that 84% uh, of the families with children in the home, um, so the majority, even if there was DCF involvement, the child was still in the home living with the household. And only 7% um, last year and 9% this year of households lost custody of a child during their participation with the Family Support Housing Program. And we did do a deep dive into the data around Family Services Division and involvement. 49% um, had a history of FSD involvement, and 67% of those families um, closed their case and did not have a new one, had no new case open while involved with Family Supportive Housing, and no new cases after exit. So we did see some significant improvement there after participation. Again, we are working and tracking on substance use and recovery. Um, you can see the, the percent of adults in recovery has been increasing slowly. And there's also um, tracking around health and well-being. Um, 
children up to date with their pediatric visits has increased and kids receiving mental health services has increased. Yeah. I was just wondering, so when you talk about child health and well-being, I don't, do you have any supports for um, parents who may be living with a disability who, um, you know, because with insurance, when you're shopping for insurance, you don't get counted um, as having five people in your household, you only get counted as having two because children don't count as households for people who are qualifying for disability um, for insurances in a lot of ways. Do you have a prioritization for families who are living um, with a parent who has a disability who's trying to support their child, or is there any supports or numbers of the people in the program that might be in that category? Hmm. Not sure I'm totally understanding your question. Do you have any numbers, or do you have any idea if there's any increase in supports for people who are living with a disability who have children? through this program. So is there any... The adults in the house. The adults, not the child. So yes. if an adult is on a disability and supporting a family, are they given any prioritization? Do you keep any data on, on how they're doing in terms of being able to access their own health care? We do. We, um, I would say the, the full report on our website would go into that in a little bit more detail, and I'm happy to answer any follow-up <coughs> questions as well. Great, um, thank you. I don't, don't know that I have statistics about that in this presentation today. Um, but we do um, certainly track information about um, disability of, of households and making sure they're connected to all the services and that they can access. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. I just was wondering, in, in response to that question, maybe Katie, when you, the slide you have on substance use recovery and treatment, I, I, is that the adults in the household? It is. Okay, yes. so I mean that's a little piece of information yes. at least about um, what that is. And then I was just wondering when you said successful, you know, back in one of your earlier yeah. slides, how do you define successful? Meaning they're still stably housed, um, they're not at risk of losing that housing, um, they have good connections and supports and are moving toward their goals in a positive way. So for a, a, a specific period of time, do you do, do you do any after, you know, after we, services follow up? We do as much as possible. It's not always possible to keep in touch with households after they exit the program, but um, we, we don't have sort of an end date for services anymore. At a certain point, it was considered to be a two-year program, and now it's just ongoing as needed based on the household. I just want to clarify, was your the follow up, so that wouldn't be specific to disability and substance use. You were just asking about, okay. Yeah. I was just asking asking that. Like, yeah. Quick at that. Different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another deep dive we did was um, to figure out what types of vouchers people were accessing um, in the Family Support Housing Program, and you can see that the family unification voucher was a huge percentage, 26% of all households. Um, and rapid rehousing vouchers, that's either through uh, the Vermont State Housing Authority and local providers, or um, um, there's also uh, assistance through the Ho Housing Opportunity Grant Program, which I'm going to talk about next. And surprisingly, 17% um, ha had an apartment with market rent with, uh, without a voucher. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry. So, I, uh, well, uh, yes, I, I know we got two other presenters before 10.35, so yes. Oh, just quick question, quick question please. Is <laughs> your connection with um, <coughs> correction. So you've got a family support, housing, mm -hmm. somebody, you know, being released or coming out of prison has a child. Do you work with them? Do you consider that one of your, you're putting them into the category of um, this very high needs. <coughs> clock Monday through Friday because we have other contractual obligations with the Department of Environmental Conservation. We're doing uh, intake on uh, PFA calls. Uh, the uh, Department of Health with the lead project in, yeah. in the schools and, and, and such in drinking water. So we have we, we have to stay open to late. We want to stay open to late. We want to be open 24/7. So who would we call if we wanted to say, hey, how's it going? If we sorry, if so who would we call? The agency when you, AHS. After hours? No, no, I meant to find out how this transition plan is. Oh, I believe that would be ESD? Sean Brown. Sean Brown. 
Deputy Commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, we also just quickly just have, uh, we have set up our system. We've done, done this for 14 years, so we've really streamlined the system and made it very efficient. Uh, and I think the agency would tell you the same thing, as well as the district offices. And, and there's this adverse weather condition, right, that we've all heard about. So when the weather drops and that, that um, formula comes into play and the moons are aligned and da da da, da. Um, you, We had over 11,000 calls just going into what we call a weather line for people to find out if there are, if there is an adverse weather condition in their district. Um, and if there is, they can hit five and then get a 211 information and referral specialist and go through the intake. And if there's not, they usually just hang up. Now we're going to continue that line, but there's not going to be anybody there to do the intake. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Madam Chair. Yes. Just um, appreciate again, yes. especially going over a little bit. Um, we were anticipating administration being able to come testify. Um, you know, I hope folks got a, a good kind of slice of what um, what's happening in the housing and business world. And, and you know, this is not rocket science. It's it's a matter of resources. Um, it's a matter of resources for building more affordable housing, more rental assistance, and more supportive services. Because we've got some very challenging families, and the you know the impacts over the course of you know those two generations, you know, ultimately that are being affected by. Uh, family family homelessness is going to ripple throughout other areas of the state budget, and we'll continue to do that for, for decades. I just want to make a comment. I was going to ask Mary Ellen, but I, I, I wonder about the opportunity to offset some of that upfront in state cost, building on her you know desire and the wish of all of us that Vermonters would be helping other Vermonters and working at 211 versus outsourcing. Um, if if other regions who all need this after hours and, and weekend coverage, per, certainly in New England where the calls aren't as great during those times, for the Vermont 211 to be the hub, a regional hub, and take money in from other states to offset that cost of that program. So I, I am. yeah, I, I, I think that would be a great business model, and um, certainly the health department relies on 211 for lots of things, and I think substance use cessation hotlines um, are, are key, and so we don't want to do RFAs with other, you know, entities, because 211 for sure is, has something no one else in the state has with their resource database. Thank you. All righty, it's, you're up. <laughs> Help me grow over lunch. While she's moving, can I have something? So, I'm feeling a, um, an anxiousness around that some things need more immediate attention than others. And I know that we all work in our own circles, but is there, and I'm just throwing this out there, is there a role for this council to respond to or keep track of what is going on with this? How did we get to the point where it got cut off on October 1? I mean, I don't think, um, no, I don't know what happened. That, that all of a sudden that there wasn't enough warning that we couldn't have prepared for plan B. So something happened. So I don't know about everybody else, but I'm sure that it's on my list now. Mr. Brown, where are you? What's going on? How are we doing? Yeah, he's a, but, yeah. and I don't, yeah. I'm having a hard time believing that in all of HS that can come up with $240,000 to continue a service that mm -hmm. everybody in AHS utilizes. Right. And that we've worked so hard to advertise to get right. people to get it in their mindset yeah. to call yeah, this. It feels like there's alternative right. alternatives. And then there's the family. The family <clears throat> that has three weeks. Right. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Well, thank, thank you for letting me express <laughs> 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 That's the transition at AHS. But I'll, I mean, certainly the. Um, Okay. Hi. Hey, folks, we're going to move on. Um, I'm Janet Kilbert. I'm the Child Development Coordinator at the Health Department. I'm also the point person in Vermont for the Center for Disease and Control, CDC's um, program called Learning Science Act Early, and we're passing out folders. Uh, inside are some wonderful parent-friendly materials on developmental milestones. So really, these little brochures, there's a little booklet that talks about all of the developmental milestones, two months through five oh, years, and also Help Me Grow literature and materials. We encourage you to look through that as we speak. There's our uh, 2018 annual report card in there as well. It looks like this, so please feel free to look at our materials as we're sharing. Thank you. 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 Thank you
sharing the story of Help Me Grow with you. This is my colleague, Elizabeth Gilman. She's the director of the Help Me Grow Resource Hub. Um, and we're here today to just make sure everybody's informed and knows about this resource. All right, so Help Me Grow, here's our objectives. We want to tell you the story of early childhood and really help you understand how important this critical period is and how it's all our responsibility to ensure that all kids have positive experiences so we can really support their health, growth, learning, and behavior. Um, we're going to explore how Healthy Grow tips the scale, um, really helps ensure positive child outcomes so that all children can realize their full capability and contribute to our communities. Um, because capable children are the basis of a sustainable and prosperous community, uh, society, and we all benefit when all children can realize their full potential and contribute their talents. Um, and brain architecture, this early childhood period, is a key time that we can establish this foundation for all of life, for all of long-term health outcomes, development outcomes, learning, school outcomes, and, and health, mental health, happiness, and success. Um, it's, it's the emergency, emerging cognitive abilities are really supported by social and emotional capabilities as well, and that's key for kindergarten <coughs> readiness. The negative effects of early exposure to adversity can be mitigated, um, so not all kids have positive experiences in early childhood. Internal depression, parental substance abuse, homelessness, poverty, um, rural isolation even can really make an impact and even disrupt cognitive development. So um, universal developmental screening across all these domains of development, including screening for social contributors of health, those are social determinants of health or social risk factors, um, can really make a difference in ensuring that young kids get connected with their families to needed resources and services as soon as possible. And we want to do it early because that's when it has the greatest long-term impact. All right, so help me grow. Uh, our vision is that, again, all children will reach their full potential, and we really want to strengthen families and their capacity to support children in this work. And our mission is to align all early childhood partners who are working on the same vision. So here's some of our strategies, and we're going to just focus on a, a few today to, to, to let you really know um, our work number three, to plug in all communities and families to a resource grid, to a, a resource hub, if you will, of all early childhood um, and family supports and resources across the state. And we're trying to support them to connect, not just to tell them about a resource, but make sure they really get connected and that service starts, the home visitor comes, um, the family was able to appeal the economic service decision. Whatever it is that we're helping them with, we want to follow up and make sure they got connected. So we develop, deliver ongoing care coordination and follow up. And we do a lot of training of all kinds of providers across the state in developmental monitoring and screening to again make sure we're catching kids as soon as possible and getting them to the right service. Okay, so what is healthy development? So again, mentioned that the, the brain architecture, if you will, or this construction process of neural development happens very quickly in, in infancy and early childhood. 85% of the brain is developed in the first year of life, 95% by age three. So uh, even though we can develop and our brains are plastic, it's a dynamic process that goes on throughout our lives, it really matters if we get it right the first time. It's much more efficient and cost effective if we could support healthy brain development from the get-go. Um, and so one of the ways we do this is um, trying to kind of support kids with positive experiences and support families with positive experiences um, so that if people experience hardships, we're offsetting it and mitigating that effect. So we're going to watch a little video here. I can pull it up. There it is. This is a four minute video that really tells the story of early childhood, things I've been talking about in a much more, um, a more comprehensive way. Tells us the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. 
positive interactions between young children and their caregivers quickly build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides good taste for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across the net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for tests, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage and toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off with all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, Kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their mind. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps the child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way, having the ability and the necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kind of nurturing experience that they need for positive development. To build better teachers, we need to build better brains. just the family's responsibility to make sure their kid turns out okay. So if you think of child development like the scales, the resilience scale, um, positive factors, positive experiences get stacked on one side, and negative things like what we've been talking about, poverty, homelessness, um, violence, trauma, maternal depression, substance use are on the other side. And so um, we're, our job is to address the negative factors, but we're really trying to front load and weight the scale with positive factors. So nurturing, caregiving relationships, like child care, schools, parent-child centers, community settings, um, positive experiences for families, like recreation programs, um, skill building, developmental play groups, pre-K, all these things really weight that scale. 
And um, again, it's not an inborn trait. It's not something that an individual has. Resilience is an outcome. And it's, it's when that scale is tipped toward the positive, even when there's negative factors on the scale. Mm -hmm. So how does Help Me Grow help communities tip that scale? So in a partnership with the Building Bright Futures Regional Councils, we put on fun family events throughout the years in all sorts of venues across Vermont to really engage all parents, the whole community, in um, learning more about early childhood development and completing developmental screening questionnaires. And we're really working to expand um, child find efforts here. This, these are federal mandates under the Individual with Disabilities Act, Part B and Part C, to find all kids with developmental concerns or developmental delays, make sure they get into intervention and needed services. So we're really trying to, to expand that capacity, birth to three, and for all families. And we'll, um, some examples, some really cool examples are, um, we have a moms group in Springfield, and one of the moms came and spoke to our early childhood action plan. So I think some of you were there and may have heard her with her little six-week-old baby. Um, we, help, we hold events in laundromats, laundry and learn, come get a free bag of books and free laundry for the day in a laundromat. Um, libraries, we have movies and we talk about social emotional development with certain movies that illustrate that, like Upside Down, I think was the movie. So we have free childcare. What was it? Inside out. Inside, Inside out. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really innovative ideas. We use free new day at the museum, and we offer developmental screening. We give lots of family-friendly materials and books. Again, um, so so just to let you know, we had 42 events last year, and, and this year alone, we reached mm -hmm. almost 4,000 families with that work. And then the other thing we do to connect <coughs> families to resources is we operate a resource hub, and this is what Elizabeth's going to share more with you about. But again, we're really trying to connect all families to good learning opportunities and environments, recreation, supportive relationships, and social opportunities, and of course, specialized services like children's integrated services. And this really helps those tip that scale and improve developmental outcomes. So when, when, I, when you're talking about activities and things like that, what, what I tend to see, at least in my community, is that families that are already connected are the ones who are getting, who are sort of getting plugged into those kinds of activities. So they've already, you know, they've gone in my community to the children's room, they're reaching out to other resources, they're already connected. Mm -hmm. um, it, I'm trying to figure out how do you folks reach the people who are not connected, who are struggling at home if they have a home um, uh, or you know in in somebody else's uh, home couch surfing or whatever how are you mm -hmm. touching those are you, mm -hmm. you know what's the relationship that you have with DCF in terms of referrals from you know families at risk there and I'm just mm -hmm. trying to figure out how absolutely. you're really reaching those families who are really at risk absolutely well you just hold let's hold that question yes. because I think the resource hub is um, one of the key ways we reach families at risk so we want Let's listen and then we'll make sure we got that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Janet, and thank you, everyone, for having us today. So, as Janet mentioned, I'm the manager of the Resource Hub. We're housed um, at United Ways of Vermont, Vermont 211. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that partnership in a minute, but I want to kind of explain what it is that our role is there at the Resource Hub. So, when Janet mentioned that, um, you know, we want to tip the scale in terms of resiliency and well being. The Resource Hub is that centralized place where families and providers can call and help families get connected to resources in their communities, to developmental, child developmental screenings, and information about child development, um, how to connect to services, and help connecting to those services. So one of the nice things about the Resource Hub is we are a whole population, so we do serve all families regardless of um, income or uh, whether or not their child has a delay or a percentage of a delay, we truly serve all Vermont families with children, um, eight or under, and prenatal parents. So when you have a system that is uh, talking to each other, um, all the players and you sort of have that grid, so to speak, families can kind of connect in a way where there's no wrong way into that system and it creates a system where there's no delays in getting children connected to services, especially when it's a case of developmental need or a family that's struggling with some um, major issues <coughs> like food and housing insecurity. 
Um, we do rely on our community partners to do this, obviously. So we want to take those systems that are siloed and talk with them and have them be part of that connection to families to kind of help me begin to move to those connection of services with our families. And I, just, I just want to ask, so I would consider, or at least in my mind, the connection is that the parent-child centers are one of your strongest Yes, absolutely, yeah. So some of our partners are folks like the parent-child centers, um, there's some early care educators that we work a lot with, the spoke uh, and hub providers, um, designated agencies, DCF, those are all agencies that we want to maybe take systems that maybe are difficult to access or maybe a little siloed in who they serve and kind of be that connection for families and for them to connect to resources, for those providers to connect, you know, it's kind of that two-way street that we want to support that that bigger system. And medical homes, I'll just add that. Medical homes are the We're really cross-sector. Yeah, absolutely. And children's integrated services as well. So I'm sorry, just I look over at Heather and I think there's this whole section of, you know, AOE. Right. So you must connect, yeah. Yes, yeah, and I'm going to actually give a little example of a family that we help navigate some of that essential early ed piece um, with a service provider. The other piece I want to mention um, in terms of the resource hub is it's not just that connection to services, it's also <coughs> care coordination and follow up. So we want to support that family as they're connecting to, as they're working with, and once they're connected to those resources and services, because we know that when we offer that follow-up and care coordination <coughs> with families, they're going to stay connected or stay connected longer, or maybe not stop at the first barrier to care. So we want to really help them brainstorm and navigate that so that they can really plug into those services that they need next year. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have to, to kind of work with our community partners to really do this, right? It's, a, it's an effort to support families in Vermont. Some of our partners that we uh, work with is the Building Bright Futures Regional Coordinators who populate a database full of playgroups and developmental playgroups for families that we're able to share with <coughs> families and service providers when they reach out to us. Obviously, um, Vermont 211 helps us have access to their database, which includes over 1,000 program, uh, 1,000 agencies and over 3,000 programs in Vermont that potentially could serve a family and help support them in their needs. And then we also work with STAMP, and you can read, it's a terrible acronym. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really doing that work with uh, perinatal moms who are dealing with some depression, anxiety, and potentially substance use disorders. And so with that opportunity, we were able to create a resource of mental health professionals that really have that expertise and training in serving those, those families and are able to help connect providers and those parents with those services, again, with that care coordination follow-up to make sure they're making that connection at a very high risk time for them and their child. So again, it's that two-generation approach. We want to support the parent. We want to do screening for the child and offer those other resources if there are those other stressors in that, in that parent's life. It might be food, it might be child care access, it might be some other, other issues. In the depth of that, um, we really spent some time thinking about what would be most helpful in giving that information to a parent. What are, what are issues that might stop a parent from accessing services when they're dealing with some of those mental health issues? And so that resource includes pretty helpful information around, are they on the bus line? Do they do telehealth if this is a parent who lives in maybe a rural community and doesn't have access to transportation? Do they have specialized training in substance abuse and maybe could address both issues with that parent? Um, what insurance do they take to kind of limit that number of doors you knock on to get the services you need because we know that's when you lose families. <coughs> So um, this is a little bit about the impact that we've had. So in 2019, you can see we made over 1,800 referrals for families, with families, and, and uh, to agencies in local and statewide agencies. Um, 
that included talking about <coughs> child behavior, um, doing screening for food insecurity and the social determinants of health that Janet mentioned. Um, we did a lot of work with kinship care <laughs> providers who were <coughs> connecting with us because they were um, taking on children of their families that were dealing with uh, part of the opiate abuse that was happening in their community um, and helping them navigate those difficult systems again because that's what we need to do to keep them connected. Um, so this is what Jen is talking about when we're talking about sort of front-loading those negative effects and trying to, to tip those scales in the positive. And so <coughs> one of the ways, and this might help too with how we do that, is to give an example and talk a little bit about AOE because they definitely are a partner at our table. Um, so we, re we received a referral from a mental health provider who was working with a mom who has addiction disorder. She also has tremendous depression and anxiety. Um, she's had a lot of negative experiences with social service systems. She has had DCF uh, intervention in the past and is pretty suspicious of statewide systems. Um, and has a three-year-old daughter who was showing concerns and delays. She was voicing concerns about her daughter's development. The child care provider was voicing concerns. And mom finally agreed to take a step to start the process to get that child connected to some early education services through the local school district. And that had barely started when um, the child care closed very abruptly. Mm. Um, so mom not only didn't have child care, but also that process stopped. She did not feel comfortable or confident to reach out to the school on her own. And this was coming up a lot in, in her sessions with her mental health provider, who really had to focus on supporting mom. That's really her role, and that's her wheelhouse, and didn't really know a lot about early education, how to connect. Um, and so she referred uh, to Help Me Grow, and we started working with mom with the mental health provider because this is somebody that she trusted, she had a relationship with. Um, you know, one of the, the things we try to, die, try to do is not make a family repeat their stories over and over and over again. It can be very traumatizing for a family. Um, and this is a mom with financial struggles, so her phone doesn't always work. So the mental health provider was the guaranteed way we could get connection to mom, and we reached out to the school district with permission, got the pre-K application, talked to the special educator, and really helped to connect that mom with the help of a mental health provider to her local elementary school special educator to get her daughter assessed and get her into pre-K so that she was also having that structure, right, that healthy, safe place where she's building up her learning and her, and her other opportunities for social um, and emotional stability and kind of building those blocks. So that's the true two-generational approach. And that's the true kind of breaking down a silo or helping a provider who maybe feels stuck and a mom who feels stuck. And then, you know, helping grow's role is to leave that door open. So in the future, if mom needs support or that mental health provider has another family they need some support with, we're happy to help. Mm -hmm. And I think this next slide, I just want to add to what Elizabeth said, people can call anonymously. So we also get a lot of calls from Vermont 211 when people have, either they're pregnant or they have an eight year old or under, they get preferred right to um, help me grow because we offer that in depth care coordination. And so if somebody's very rarely isolated, not connected to community supports, they may call 211 for something. That's one way we can get connected. They can not tell us a thing about themselves, and we will help them and eventually try to build that relationship so we can call them back and get some demographic information to do some more care coordination for them. Uh, we partner closely with home visiting, and then we also partner with early care and education providers. 70%, I think, so let's grow kids to stick with working parents who have some form of child care. And so child care providers can really be these front, uh, you know, uh, front loading that scale as a workforce to build relationships with all types of parents and really educate them using developmental screening tools in early childhood developmental milestones. What is social and emotional development? How do they support emerging skills as parents? And so we've trained almost half 
Vermont's child care workforce to date, and our, we are partnering with Let's Grow Kids to train the remaining amount, and we have preschool development renewal funds hopefully coming to help us in that work, um, continued work. But we have um, prepared 70 classrooms of kids now. We'll be better prepared to go to kindergarten. That's almost a quarter of the kindergarten classrooms in the state. So we hope that all kids will, and all parents will be partners in this work of making sure their kids are ready socially, emotionally, and developmentally for kindergarten, or have the extra support and practice skills get connected to early intervention before kindergarten, for sure. And so this is a great statistic, too. Um, we have trained almost 700 cross-sector providers, beyond child care providers, in developmental monitoring and screening with referral for further evaluation and services. And as a result, from our baseline here, we've seen the average age of referral to early intervention, which is special education birth to three, um, drop by almost half. So at 26 months in 2014, now at 14 months, which is a fabulous thing because kids get services longer and at an earlier age. I guess we can wrap up just in the next couple of minutes. Yes. Do yeah. you also work with pediatricians' offices? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're just to hear that. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're just not focusing on that, but we um, work with uh, one of our key partners is the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program. They're, they've done years, decades worth of quality improvement work in medical homes. And so we do train pediatricians in developmental screening and connect them with the resource hub. And we partner very closely, as they're referring to Elizabeth, but certainly for addressing social determinants of health and connecting families to resources. And we, with family permission, always let the medical home know the work we've done so everyone's on the same page. Any other questions? Great. Thank you so much Thank for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you answer my question? Okay. <laughs> So I think that uh, Auburn has been kind enough to say that she would postpone her presentation, and I think I'm going to take you up on that. Oh, okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Um, I, as I see, our um, guests from the agency of implementation are here, and um, the agency, yeah, and the agency of natural resources. So please come on. Good morning. For the record, I'm Peter Walk, uh, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. I'm Dan Dutcher. I'm the Environmental Policy Manager with the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Uh, so we're working on a topic that uh, isn't uh, interesting how it relates to your work, and so I just wanted to describe sort of uh, what we're doing in general. So uh, one of the main drivers for our, uh, our issues with uh, dealing with the impacts of climate change is to address emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, emissions from the trans greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector represent 43% of our emissions statewide. Uh, it is the hardest nut to crack because Vermonters uh, live in primarily rural, rural areas with long ways to travel, and it is a major driver about ability to get jobs and all, all sorts of things. But uh, we, we're good at uh, trying to figure out solutions to complicated public policy issues. That's why we all do this, right? Um, I mean, I could add, but we try. <laughs> um, we hope we're good at it. So one of the, the, the things that we've been working on to try to address uh, this challenge is to work across a regional group of states to, um, to come up with a way that, that creates a larger market and a driving force um, across the country. So the region that we're talking about is every state, including the District of Columbia, uh, from Virginia, kind of north, along the along the eastern seaboard. Um, so it ends up being 12, 12 states and the District of Columbia. We call ourselves the jurisdictions because DC makes things complicated and doesn't let us just say states. Um, we've been in a conversation since 2010 about how to how to work together on this topic. Um, it builds off. A, conversation, a program that was launched at the uh, end of the 2000s known as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cap and invest program for emissions from the uh, power production sector, so all of our electric utilities. Um, and the idea was, could we do something similar uh, for the transportation sector? As soon as we got into the work, we realized how much harder it was. You're, when you're talking about large electricity generators, it's large single point sources that 
uh, have the ability to make huge changes to their operations in one, you know, one <coughs> foul swoop. We are all the emissions generators for the transportation sector, right? That's fundamentally what it comes down to. Um, we need opportunities for us all to be able to have different choices and make different choices. Um, so what we've been looking at is trying to figure out exactly how that might work and doing the research necessary to sort of back up what the program might look like. And so last December, uh, nine of those states plus the District of Columbia agreed to start a, um, a uh, process to evaluate a cap and invest program for transportation emissions across the region. Three states were missing from that statement all of those states have been actively at the table part of the discussion so it really is the whole region the idea was that we would this was started as a executive branch function but we certainly understand that the legislature will will be engaged in this process <coughs> to, to come back to, to each state to let them then decide whether they wanted to participate um, the way a cap and invest program works is that typically in a any sort of pollution reduction scheme Say you're all the emitters of whatever it happened to be. I would ask each one of you to reduce your pollution content by 25%, or whatever the number might be. Regardless of your ability to meet that, you would have to. In the way a cap and invest works is I tell the group that you need to reduce your emissions by 25%, and you figure out amongst yourselves who can do it most cost effectively. So we get the same amount level of reduction at the most cost effective method. The, what, we, what we do in Reggie is add the invest component of it where the way you sort of work that trading is to buy uh, allowances, essentially what the term of art is, essentially your, 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 your amount of, uh, of carbon pollution that you're purchasing in an auction and then we reinvest those proceeds in things that are going to further reduce emissions. The Reggie program, the legislature determined that those should go towards weatherization. So much of the work at Efficiency Vermont that goes towards weatherization and Vermont Gas and Burlington Electric is, is coming from the Reggie proceeds. In the, that, that decision was made in part because we had an existing electric efficiency program. Many states didn't, and so they have plunge most of their proceeds back into those sorts of efforts. The, 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 the benefit of the investment is that it then reduces the pressure, so the demand pressure for, you know, so already your, all of your emissions would then be lowered by the amount of efficiency that we gained. And so you would have less work to do and therefore the price, the market price would be low. We would envision doing something similar in the transportation world um, and we are working with stakeholders to figure out exactly where that point of regulation should be. Because it's really easy in the power production world to put it at the sort of the power plant itself. That's relatively straightforward. That's where the generator is. That's where changes can easily happen. Or not easily, but efficiently happen. For transportation, because we're all the generators, we're not going to make every Vermonter go into an auction somewhere online to figure out how they report their own emissions and buy their associated allowance. It wouldn't work. We'd spend more in compliance and enforcement than we would in the revenue from the program. So we're looking upstream in the fuel supply network to try to understand where it could best be, be placed. Um, then the idea is then we take those proceeds and invest them in programs that help Vermonters. And they, that could come in a number of forms. The region isn't going to dictate how that money gets spent. That will be a decision that the legislature takes on. And, chooses for itself with obviously we'll provide you with some advice on how we might think we might best do that so there'll be always be a balance between how many how is it, how are those investments leading to reduced emissions and therefore lowering our price impact overall and what are the other public policy goals that we want to achieve at the same time uh, that can be beneficial um, every time we have a new uh, source of revenue in, in government, we all get excited about the potential for what it could be, but we want to make sure that it, there's, the, there's good balance uh, back and forth. I mean, we can be thinking about everything from uh, supporting electric vehicle charging networks and uh, helping people get into electric vehicles and, and lower emission vehicles generally, 
we could be thinking about uh, increasing uh, alternative transportation methods, whether that be public transportation or van pooling or any bike head stuff. Um, could be things like how do we support communities to uh, to create that sort of vision of the future where they are sort of sustainable within their own communities. They have the 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 village store and the community gathering place that is an anchor so that people are in their cars less anyways. There's all sorts of ways we could go about thinking about how those revenues could be used uh, that meet our, our greenhouse gas emissions goals. And so we gave ourselves a year to do this. Uh, if you can imagine negotiating, so each state has a representative from their transportation, their environmental agency, and their energy agency at the table. So 13 times three, you get 39 people around the room, and you have to convince them all to agree on something. And over, and over, <laughs> and over, 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 Right, and so it's a complicated process where we're trying to work through it, and we gave ourselves probably less time than we sh would, should have, but we all understand the urgency of the challenge we face, and so we're we're doing our best to get um, get to an answer quickly. The current timeline is we just put out the beginning of October kind of framework for the program of what it might look like, what it might mean. I can provide uh, the website information for that if it's helpful, um, and then. In December, we'll put out a draft memorandum of understanding that would essentially be the framework for the states, the, agree, the sort of draft agreement between the states that would dictate what the program would actually look like. Um, and included in that will be a couple of different options for what the, the cap looks like. So the cap, so where we set the maximum amount of emissions to be and how it declines over time is what ultimately dictates the, the price impacts at the pump and what we have for investment to, to, to make changes. And so um, people are obviously going to be very interested in that topic. Mm -hmm. That's why um, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. Yes. Okay. It is part of the conversation that you're having with this program that you're trying to put out is um, how it affects different populations. I mean, we all know that you know low-income people suffer and suffer the most from climate events and change, and um, how they are able to participate in a brighter energy future uh, is is a big concern, and that they're not the ones also uh, bearing the burden of of uh, whatever uh, choices are being made. Um, and we've done some things in the state with uh, you know with low-income weatherization and your transportation climate initiative stuff in terms of, of trying to put um, uh, efficient vehicles in the hands of low income. We know that the, um, that the, uh, the amount of, of subsidy that, has to, that is helpful to especially low income families is probably greater than what we're able to do now. So I'm just wondering where that fits in the conversation sure. of what you're trying to do and how it affects low income families. And, mm -hmm. Sure, I, that, that, that's a great question and, and one I'm sorry that I didn't address off the top. And the equity concerns are first and foremost in our mind because if we think about our transportation network right now, we already have our low income populations being overburdened by the amount of, amount of their resources they're spending on transportation related uh, expenses anyways. TCI can have impacts both positive and negative on that and we need to be thoughtful about how we, we, we interact with those concerns. Um, certainly, we are thinking about how do we be sense, how, how do we, so let, me, let me be clear on one point, so that the sort of the, the structure of the cap portion of the, reg, the regulatory side of things, there isn't typically, there isn't, you can't really make a distinction. Uh, everybody would, they do it, but what you do with the resources on the back end really matter, and how do you mitigate the some of the, the cost drivers and, and effects there? Um, that could go towards a low income rebate. That's a possibility associated with the program. Um, I, it might be useful for we're talking about this in general terms. It might be useful to think about sort of hypothetical dollar figures 
um, as a way to sort of bracket what we're talking about. So the Regional Gra Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which has been in place for 10 years now, the price, the, the pr if, if you were to take that price for what the, a, a ton of carbon costs and translate it into a, the impact on a price of a gallon of gas, it would be roughly five cents. So if you think about, so if, if, you've got a, if you've got a Vermonter who's driving an old pickup truck and has to drive 20,000 miles a year to get to and from their job, that's about, uh, at current gas prices, it's about $85 extra a year on the five grand they're already spending on fuel. So <coughs> it's only about a 1.6% increase in the overall price of their fuel. But it is, you know, when you have existing burdens, we don't want we don't want to necessarily be adding onto those, uh, or we want to figure out ways to be able to target programs that are going to help all Vermonters be part of that sort of clean energy future. Um, it is the hardest part of this program to figure out, and it's, but it's the sort of nature of public policy, right? There are always going to be changes that we make that that we need to uh, figure out what the ramifications. Are. I just want to make sure that they, they are you yep. know, a major concern first, in your first discussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is about transportation in general um, and the lack of like, public okay. transportation, particularly in rural areas. And when we're talking about um, access to after school, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's more than individuals driving. Um, and that cost to, to them and gas, it's really access when we're talking about equity. And I'm just wondering how you all are thinking or planning around kind of building a, a public transportation system, particularly in rural areas, that all families um, or kids, you know, just how, what, what's your goal or plan? Well, this is an existing issue, right, quite apart from climate and energy, and it's something that the Agency of Transportation, working with a lot of stakeholder groups, uh, has been into for many years. Um, some of you might know that VTrans, um, or in Vermont, we spend a, a larger proportion of our transportation budget on public transit than most other states. It's quite a significant sum, and uh, we're actually you know, we could get into a, a sort of ironic position where uh, if we wanted to divert a lot of uh, TCI funds into public transit in rural areas, we could have more funding than we could reasonably spend because you don't want to send empty buses, you know, going around. Uh, it just wouldn't be cost effective. So one of the things we're looking at at VTrans, uh, quite apart from TCI, is how to uh, make public transit more accessible in rural areas uh, in a way that's both cost effective and climate effective. And some of that uh, might involve micro transit, uh, which we're looking into, and other forms of sort of on-demand type transit. Uh, and we've gotten some interesting feedback from stakeholders. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of different groups in the TCI process. Uh, one of the ideas that came up is sort of mass transit for stuff. You know, instead of sending people around to uh, the different places they need to go, you can have some kind of delivery service, uh, which I thought was interesting. I don't know how that's going to pencil out, but a lot of people are, are thinking about this kind of thing. And I mean, certainly um, uh, transit's a very important thing on the list of potential investments, especially when we start uh, thinking about um, equity. And one of the things we can do, I'm, I'm not sure how much this will uh, move us forward on the accessibility issue, but in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, converting um, diesel buses, both public transit and school buses, uh, to electric um, would certainly do a lot to you know, clean up both conventional air pollution and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And one of the places to start doing that might be in rural areas, because if you look at the ridership in the more urbanized areas, you're already getting pretty good MPG per rider. Whereas, you know, out in the, in the rural areas, not so much. So there'd be some logic to starting there with some of those programs. And we do have um, pilot programs underway through the VW settlement process to start converting buses. And um, VTrans is also using federal <coughs> loan 
plans to start doing that. We are uh, right now bringing electric buses into Vermont, and the, the technology is pretty good. It's um, pretty mature, especially in transit buses, and it's um, probably there also in school buses. So really one of the things that TCI needs to do, both in transit and in a lot of other sectors, is to help bring this technology up to scale. Uh, we just need uh, mass production, and um, we need the infrastructure around it, like charging infrastructure. Mechanics have to get used to dealing with this kind of thing. And um, you know, Vermont combined with um, the other 12 jurisdictions in the TCI region, I think we're something like the third biggest economy in the world. Um, so it could really have a, a very positive effect on bringing some of these technologies up to scale. I think the other thing to think about from our from the Vermont experience, right? And we've had, been having trying to have these conversations with the other sort of northern New England and more rural states mm -hmm. in the conversation because we're all dealing with the same, you know, same existing concerns and the same potentially exacerbated concerns. Um, is how do we improve access? And I think our public transit systems have largely been based on trying to take a dense urban model and expand it into a rural setting where our world, our lives don't operate on point-to-point -point basis, right? We need to go from home to school to work to grocery store to school to home. And right now that we're not set up for that sort of, <coughs> and so it becomes a complete lack of convenience. And so we don't have the demand to form the basis to be able to sort of make make changes within that. My, my hope is that some of these resources could be used to prove out some of the more sort of creative concepts around how we might address some of these things, whether the public transit for goods or whatever, or microtransit or um, something like um, Capstone is, is working on now to sort of take these pools of resources that we have for Meals on Wheels and bringing folks to medical appointments and using it in an effective way to make sure that we can touch more people and, and help make people's lives better. Two more questions. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to just quickly make those comparisons to the economic impact of rural Vermont versus mm -hmm. Boston, Massachusetts, or New York City. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, it appears to me that there's a lot of planning that has to be done to compensate for the expense, um, and particularly dealing with school buses, for example. I mean, it's a lot of Yeah, I mean, this is, it, it's critical. And then, of course, it, um, it, it is about setting up charging stations, and I mean, the economic impact for the is be severe. Particularly in, for people involved in this committee, uh, and, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. And I know that you're working hard and so on. But I'm not sure if that's part of the really part of the discussion. It is. Yeah, yeah it, it's a very important part of the discussion. I, I think people in the, involved in TCI have been aware of the regressive effect of increasing gas prices from day one. And uh, it's certainly at the forefront of the conversations uh, on uh, how to structure uh, the investment scenario. And you know, one of the things we can do, other than looking at transit, is also just accepting the reality of rural Vermont and realizing that a lot of people just get around in single occupancy vehicles. Uh, that's not going to go away anytime soon. And we have the technology today. Uh, for electric vehicles in the next uh, few years, we're going to start seeing a wave of new models, including all-wheel drive models, uh, full-size pickups, and SUVs. They're going to be expensive, no, uh, especially at first, but one of the things uh, we can do is to uh, target um, purchase incentives and lease incentives uh, toward lower-income populations, and we're doing that now with a small-scale existing incentive program that we're trying to set up. Um, and we're going to start seeing a, um, a growing used car market. Um, we're starting to see that already. Um, so there, there will be options, and, and I would emphasize too that the cap is not going to be um, you know, draconian. It's going to start off uh, gently, and uh, I think uh, if we do this right, the economic effects will be positive for everybody involved. 
uh, because obviously uh, climate change is going to have uh, devastating effects on, on everyone concerned. We need to wrap up. Sure. Representative Lamper has so, a question. Thank you, thank you for coming. So from what I understand, you, you're going to be coming out in December with recommendations or policy draft. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to come to the legislature. That's why I really wanted right. this committee, or one of the things I wanted to invite you is because transportation and access to transportation and the cost of it disproportionately you've already heard the, the impact on, the, on this particular group. So they're going to be very, very anxious and worried. So I want to make sure that, you know, that we hear you and that you hear us, that um, those options that come out in December have a, have, a, have a way for us to address that population that's going to have need. And does it get to the emissions issue? Right. And I'm, you know, I know you've heard public transit and access and expanded public transit. Is, is big, but also the incentive program. Uh, so thank you. I, I maybe end on on this point. I think this is a really sort of important point for the close. Uh, is the 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 direction that we've gotten from the governor is go out, work with the region, come up with the best possible setup within this kind of framework for Vermont, and then let's come back and we'll have a conversation about whether it actually makes sense. Right, there's no, we're in for sure. There's a, what are the details? Because until we sort of set some, set the price, so it's like the cap parameters in our economic model, we don't know what the actual outcome might be. And so it's easy to have the conversation in very general terms, but until we see what the results are, we can't come to you and be like, here's, here's what it actually means. And here's the good we might be able to do with those resources. <laughs> and here's the balance. And here's what the economic impact is, because as people transition to lower emissions vehicles and more electric vehicles, their actual transportation burden drops drastically, given the, the, the less expense of either using electricity or simply burning less gas. Um, so those are huge factors that we need the details of to be able to come back with. And so in, in the idea is now in December, we're going to have most of the pieces ironed out at the regional level. But it's enough for us to start the conversation with you to say, here's what, what we you know, anticipate um, so that we can, we can get moving um, in that conversation. Well, I look forward to being a partner in that. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, committee. Um, here's what I would, uh, what I've been thinking. Um, I we have our uh, offsite meeting in November. We know, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, uh, one of the you know goals of our committee is to come up with recommendations uh, for the um, legislature as a whole, and so we want to weigh in on what's <coughs> going to happen in the biennium, the second part of the biennium. Um, so I'm thinking we will need a December meeting to discuss that, but in between we can have a subcommittee, which I think will be comprised of um, Representative Lamper, myself, and maybe two or three other people talk about, uh, you kind of review what we've heard at our various meetings and then come up with um, recommendations based on what we've heard and look at you know what we had recommended um, last year as well. And then, so that then at the uh, December meeting, we could have gotten that those out to, uh, we'll work with Katie on that, of course, and Jesse are taking notes, that's great. Um, and we would get that out to uh, folks before the December meeting, and then at December we'd spend most of our time uh, talking talking through them and, and making sure we're, we agree on those. How does, how does that sound? And then we give uh, Auburn a little time at that meeting also to, to present. <laughs> how does that sound to folks? Well, will part of that involve uh, um, other committee members being able to submit things that we think should be absolutely done. yes yeah yeah definitely <coughs> that be part of it yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay all right so well let's just uh, talk about December then while we're on that subject that I think our regular date would be December nineteenth yeah. um we had emailed briefly about the December meeting yes yes and I'm just wondering is there any way that we can give that some. Yes, and time as well. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. I, I did. I, I thought of it at one point that I didn't say it just then. But thank. Yes. Absolutely. We, we can do that. Yeah. 
Um, so let's see. Yeah, just so December nineteenth would be um, so nine thirty to eleven thirty on December nineteenth. We'd be yeah, okay. here. Yeah, hopefully here. Okay. We'll talk 9.30. 9.30 to 11.30. Is it 11.30? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Oh. And the state house is open by then? Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, November 15th. <coughs> so as a matter of fact, the, the week of the 16th. So, the, so that week, um, House Appropriations is meeting for budget adjustment. That's right. Week. So I'll already be here, so no double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike already sent it out to all of us <laughs> for that day. Because yeah. I already have it. Oh, good. Okay, yeah. great. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. All right. Well, good. So that's about who would who would like to join um, Diane and me in the and Carlin. I mean, everybody was. Everybody was. Everybody was. Everybody was. Everybody's in because everybody needs to submit something. <laughs> well, that's true for sure. We're submitting. I, I, I envision maybe like a Zoom call or something like that um, in, in between to discuss. Um, so Katie would like. Yeah, I mean, oh if you're going to do something like a Zoom call or something, maybe you can open it up to everybody. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 All right. So Diane and I'll kind yeah. of uh, spearhead things, and then I'll open it up to everybody and whoever would like to join in. Would be. But I'm also happy to submit anything. Okay. Well, definitely feel free. Or whatever. Yeah, definitely feel free by email uh, to go ahead and you know submit that to uh, to me and Diane, and um, we'll start compiling that. Sure. We'll see those. each other in November. Yes. Yeah, we'll see each other. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a structure okay. for that meeting yet? Yes, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Do we have a structure? Just about yes. that. I, I, I did speak with Tom Donahue yep. yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> was it yes? It was yesterday. And he's preparing a list of menu or whatever, some speakers and the like. And I would encourage um, anyone who would like to. Uh, have someone present to reach out perhaps to me mm -hmm. or to Tom mm -hmm. down here with Brock. What's, can we just talk about, I, and I apologize, I may have missed it. So are we not doing it the same way we did it last year where it's going to be kind of a, a, a led discussion where we, we as committee members and definitely a rep or a senator um, sit at a table and ask questions and then kind of talk as a group? I think the program Tom has some locals coming in the street to us Cause I, I think with their with their issues and to present to us some of those problems and issues that we have in uh, in our locale, for example, that I know are spread throughout the state, of course. So uh, how do people who maybe are in other parts of the state who want to be heard, because it is our public mm -hmm. hearing, get... Um, to do Bring so. voice in. And, and does that need to go through us or is that something where, because I know I've shared this mm. with a lot of my different um, affiliation groups and, and there's a lot of, you know, like the AmeriCorps um, team and the VISTAs are interested and some of the people in different housing um, and disability areas. So I just want to make sure in special ed, um, how do they maybe get to be heard or included in that? I, I did talk to Tom myself at the last community action meeting and um, he did say that they, they will be setting up something so that the public, the public. Uh, certainly is it's open to the public and they're welcome to come. Uh, and um, there will be some time devoted, certainly the, the largest portion devoted to hearing from community members um, on, on whatever their concerns are. Whether it will be structured exactly like the one in, in NECA was, uh, I'm, I'm unsure. but. Tom did say he wanted to have some presenting from the, you know, um, poverty uh, people providers to talk about what their concerns are. And we did something like that in NECA as well. Um, there was a lot of providers and a lot I'm of I'm thinking more of like yeah. stakeholders, yeah. people right. who are experiencing right. poverty across the state who really have some diverse Right. needs that maybe don't line up necessarily with service providers because I know we had a lot of service sure. providers and mm -hmm. I would I as a committee member would love to see that be more expanded I'd love to be able to get family supportive housing participants to come in and talk about the program and their experiences mm -hmm. in the program and special ed and housing because I think some of the conversation around the quality of interventions and services in Vermont and the amount of money we're putting into those services that maybe isn't 
coming across and it's not translating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The experience you're getting isn't necessarily the information that you hear when you sit in this room. Sure. And I think there are a lot of people who might be off put coming into a room if they're not on a program or if they're not necessarily representing an organization. It's really hard to come up and say, Hey, I'm Katie Ballard and I live in poverty in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you all of my most shameful moments and and get your pity looks. So I just want to make sure that this is accessible for the people that this committee specifically really is here to be a voice for. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did I did relate that to Tom. He yeah. did say that they yeah. would be doing some kind of a public, you know, people would feel free to come in and talk. It'd be a meal and that type of things that and do we have a would be invited to. So. Um, I'd be happy to make one if the information came to me. I'd be happy to make one oh, so that it can be shared on social, I would social just media. Are you familiar with Tom Dunn? I, I, I can get in touch with I was going to say, I, maybe Karen and I. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said you wanted to do. A poster. poster. Like we had a oh, poster sure. or something for the, for you know, for people, yeah, to, to send an <clears throat> email and everything. But maybe I could get in touch with him. And get in touch with Tom. Uh, I think it would be good to be in touch with him and just He's impress got a lot of him resources. again okay. uh, the need for that, that public in that community. I think that's really important. Yes. Time to and we, we have it out to the schools now. And we have Great. It out to different shelters, et cetera, et cetera, that we're going to be. I've been at like four conferences this week alone, and I've been putting it out there to everybody at those, like the legal aid clinic yesterday. They were pretty interested in coming down. So. We had to help people. We get you something in your hands. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, no, and I know there were people from the, the, the wage uh, people wanted to come in and at least, you know, um, talk about mm, their issues right, yeah. and that type of thing. So. Yeah. Hopefully it works for everybody. Yeah. And did we talk about um, accessibility? So if somebody doesn't have transportation to get to Rutland but wants to share, is that something where, because I know we talked about it briefly at the first council meeting, do we, did we think anything on that? Are you, are you, I'm sorry, can I? So are you thinking like I'm thinking maybe here's the email address if you have something or statement like a written that you, that you want to that might that be another submit. yeah um, yeah it so, might be another yeah. avenue to just get more feedback mm -hmm. from stakeholders throughout the state because I did hear from a lot of people uh, up in Chittenden County and up in like the St Albans area mm -hmm. who were saying that Rutland is pretty far and they don't have a car mm -hmm. um, or money to take right. the multiple buses. Well, sometimes that if they would. just if they can write an email yeah, yeah. Us, so but an email yeah. address that would that we could maybe put on that poster or something mm -hmm. saying. Probably saying it's mine, but. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would be great. Thank you. That we can yeah, gather it all together. Poster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Katie. Very important. Great. Anything else we need to do? We are so yeah. good. <laughs> we didn't even want to. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to have a comment. Yes. Just, just a quick note. You know, I flashed through them very quickly, but we do have a lot of a lot of resources that I mentioned at the very beginning of uh, the housing and homelessness testimony. We have hard copy. I didn't pass them around because I didn't want to bury everybody in the paper. They're also all available on on the committee website. But if anybody does want any of those uh, document background documents, there's copies all on the table back there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did everybody do the sign-up sheet?